FCCSJ English Ministry Sunday Service. My name is Jeff and I'm a part of the ushering and greeting team. Uh, we would love for you to unmute yourself and allow everyone to see you by enabling your video uh, so we can greet each other as a church family this morning. Hey, Hello. Hello. Hello, Lucas. Hello. Hello, cute guys. <laughs> Look at the babies. Morning, Lita. Hello. Morning, Lita. Thank you. Morning, David. Hey, Elias. Hi, Grace. Hey, David. Hey, other David. That's not David. <laughs> hey, John. Hey, Laura. Look at Elias. He's sitting there. Oh. Sophia. Will with shadows. <laughs> oh, hey, Emma. Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello, hello. It's something over there in the setting. Nice. <laughs> hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Lucas. <laughs> we will always give you time for baby Lucas. Uh, just a friendly reminder, if you are new and you would like to receive our Sunday bulletin, uh, please email Pastor Halicon. You can find his email uh, in the Zoom chat below. Uh, today we have four announcements. Beginning this week, uh, our pastors invite all of you to have a conversation with them about how to consider race, justice, and current events in light uh, of what God has to say about justice in scripture. Uh, these fireside chats will take place uh, Thursday evenings from 8.30 to 9.30. Uh, we encourage you to come with questions you may have, uh, a posture to love, uh, to listen, and to learn from one another. Uh, next announcement is, uh, we wanna hear your ideas about how we can show kindness to our neighbors as a community during this season of shelter in place. Uh, please submit your ideas by the end of day today via the link in the Sunday Bulletin. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact Bill Chen. Uh, next is a friendly reminder that the Married Couples Fellowship uh, will be meeting next Sunday uh, from 4.30 to 6.30. Uh, reach out to Mike if you have any questions. Uh, also, la uh, last reminder is that there's no salt shakers this coming Saturday, the 27th. Remember, you'll be meeting with your salt shakers summer small groups uh, this week. And if you don't know when your group is meeting, please reach out to your S3G leader uh, or contact Hannah if you have any questions. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Hannah, who will lead us in praise and worship. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, welcome again, everyone, to our uh, Sorry, I think there's someone be muted really quick. I think we're good now. Uh, but again, uh, welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, gathering online for our worship service. Um, yeah, please rise as we enter into a time of praise and worship. <clears throat> uh, today's call to worship is from Psalm uh, 60, 63, um, and God's word reads, O God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh thirsts for you, as in the dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live, in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied, fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate you, meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. Let's pray. And helping Father God, um, yes God that, <sighs> Yeah, it is our prayer today, God. Um, yeah, God, as we gather uh, online, um, God, we uh, just really cry out to you um, that you would be our greatest desire. God, forgive us for when we often choose other things over you, desire other things, pursue after other things. But God, remind us, you have reminded us in your word today that you... Uh, yeah, or what our soul thirsts for, um, that when we seek after other things, none of those things will satisfy us. The only thing that will truly satisfy us um, is you. God, help us to yeah, taste and see that you are good. Um, 
And so as we sing today, God, um, God, would the words that we sing not just be words of a song, but would it be uh, out of our hearts uh, that we sing these words of love and of praise to you, God. Um, so God, we sing to you now. God, would your glory, uh, would your spirit uh, be moving in us, God. Well, let's sing. How lovely, how lovely is your dwelling place, O oh Lord Almighty, for my soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied Within your presence I sing beneath the shadow of your wings And better is one day in your courts Better is one day in your house, better is one day in the courts, thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. One thing I ask, one thing I ask, and I would seek to see your beauty to find you in the place your glory dwells sing that again one thing I ask one thing I ask and I would seek to see your beauty, to find you in the place your glory dwells. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. And better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. My heart, my heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God, your spirit's water to my soul. I've tasted and I've seen, come once again to me, I will draw near to you, I will draw near to you. Better is one day, better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere, and better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere, better is one day, and better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. And better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere, and thousands elsewhere.
Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. You never change. You never fail, oh God. And true are your promises. True are your promises. You never change. You never fail, oh God. So we raise up. We raise up holy hands to pray a holy one who was and is and is to come. Yeah. change you never feel oh God why does your love why is your love and grace oh why is your love and grace you never change you never feel oh God so we holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. Yeah, we raise up holy hands to praise You were. Oh, you were. You are. You will always be. You were. You are. You will always be. You were. New City Catechism um, is a statement of beliefs, of truths that we believe. Um, and so um, I will read the question 
and then we will answer and read the passage together. Um, so the question today is, what do we believe about the Holy Spirit? And we answer, we answer together that he is God, co-eternal with the Father and the Son, and that God grants him irrevocably to all who believe. And we'll read John 14, 16 to 17 uh, together. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Uh, let's sing in response. There's nothing. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord and hold Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. I tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit you are here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. In your presence, Lord, let us become, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit, you are welcome 
air. Come flood this place in filthy atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. In your presence, Lord. Help me, Father God. Um, yes, God. Um, would it be your glory um, that fills each of our homes, uh, that fills the world, God? Um, Holy Spirit, um, yes, would you um, be moving in our hearts? Uh, would you be renewing our spirits? Um, would you be convicting our hearts? Um, as we hear your word preached um, through Pastor Lita, God. Um, thank you, God. Um, thank you, Holy Spirit, um, for your presence in our lives, for your presence with us, God. Um, yes, God, how good it is to know you, how good it is um, to be able to be called um, your children, and to be known by you. So God, thank you um, for who you are. Um, yeah, we pray all this in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen. Um, you may be seated. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Oh, I hear a little back. Sorry, that's my fault. I should not talk so loud. Um, Good morning. Uh, welcome to CFC. It's good to have everyone with us this morning. Uh, my name is Helicon. I'm one of the pastors of CFC. And today, if it's your first time, then you know, you're know you going to get a little surprise because um, it's not Pastor Helicon or Pastor Joey preaching. Um, but we're invite we have a friend visiting as our summer guest speaker, our pastor from Fremont, a good friend of mine, Lita, Pastor Lita Wong um, from Restore 22. And before I even begin, I wanted to give you a little background, okay? Um, about Pastor Lita, and I have a little bio for him, but I wanted to share a story about how I met Pastor Lita, or how to, I heard about him, and eventually I wanted to get to know him, and the picture is such a part of the story. So what happened was, um, in, I think, 2008, 2009, when I moved to Fremont, and I was at a church called Grace Church Fremont, um, I, I, one of my elders of my church, I, his daughter, is, his name is Jessica, um, was married to Lita. And I had heard about Lita from friends. And I heard about this pastor guy that I had to meet because, you know, you know, I'm an outgoing person. And I heard Lita was a very outgoing person. And we never really connected and never got a chance to really meet up. But I just over the years, I would hear about him. And then I think about four years ago, or three years ago, I, or two years ago, even, I think I saw a, um, I saw a picture of him on one of my friends walls tagged. And it was my, one of my little brothers from my former youth group um, named, uh, and named Jesse. And in it, it was a picture of Lita wearing this gold, I think it was like a Gucci robe, right, and gold shoes. And I was like, I got to meet this guy with this kind of personality. And I, and I, I think we finally got to meet about two years ago. We became good friends, fast friends, and we talked along the way and fellowshiped many times. And Pastor Lita is a church planting right now in Fremont for a church called Restore 22. I have it here if you guys ever want to check out his site. And um, a little bit of background of Pastor Lita was that he left a recruiting startup to, to do his MDiv at Fuller Theological Seminary. And after he finished his seminary degree, he was also an associate pastor for an all-black church. And then he moved to a, a, a white church. And then afterwards, he's now planting in Fremont. And uh, he loves his wife, Jessica, and they have a child, a newborn, Hudson. Um, and he loves Phil's coffee. And one of the things else about him is he likes to play basketball, and he's a slow, careful jump shooter. So that's his background, and I'd like to introduce Brother uh, Pastor Lita to come up and, well, not come up, but to jump on and um, to share with us today. Thank you, uh, Pastor Helicon, Pastor Joey, uh, elders and staff for having me today. Thank you for that intro, Helicon. It's, um, it is a privilege to, to be with you this morning, and um, I just want to say thank you for having me here. Uh, just to serve you and to share with you uh, God's word today. It's um, it's an honor to be with you guys. And 
uh, I am filled with joy just to be here. So um, a little bit um, about um, what we're doing. So I grew up in East San Jose. So I know some of you guys live near there, uh, but between there and Fremont, that's kind of where I came up. And um, right now, uh, about 18 months ago, we started a meeting uh, just as a, as a little group of nine people in our living room. Um, and you can start, go ahead and show the first slide. Uh, we started doing community uh, oriented events. Uh, we wanted to plant a church that would be multi-ethnic, uh, multi-generational, and a church that would eventually plant churches as well. So uh, we started doing uh, community events for the block. A bunch of these people are, aren't even Christian in this picture. We were wrapping presents. This was in 2019, uh, this past year. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, we just continue to uh, do things, you know, around the community. Um, the next picture should show also, um, if you can go to the next one, Jocelyn. Uh, we basically uh, got together events where we had invited the community to join us. People that were far from God, people that didn't know of the church or any, you know, anything to do with, you know, Christianity. Um, and if you go to the next slide, uh, after we did a bunch of those, we hit it, we did a block party. This was back in November, 2019. Uh, we had about 50 people come to that. Uh, basically, um, it was incredible about this block party. This is in my garage. Uh, we had a flamenco guitarist, uh, volunteer his, uh, set for us. Cause I, I was at that time I was playing in a bar, uh, to meet people. So I was playing drums, uh, just me talking to people after sets. And I met this, I met this flamenco guitarist and a bunch of other musicians came out too. Um, I met people through uh, playing, uh, playing ball at the gym and I've had my core team also bring people. So uh, here's a picture of one of our block parties that we did and our neighbors too. We just had a bunch of neighbors over for some good food and drink. And then if you go to the next slide, then we invited people back to a worship gathering in December. This is last year of 2019. Um, so we, we started with um, a little p group of people in our living room, a handful of people, and then we uh, started doing community events and eventually led a year later to what you see in this picture here is um, in an auditorium we rented out. And then uh, we settled um, at this first preview gathering, we had about 70 people. And what they tell you is um, that you'll kind of cut in half or about maybe 30 to 50% will come back. And that's where you build your church on. So the next picture you can see here, this is how we've been building our church. Uh, we have been meeting about 30 of us or so. Uh, this is before COVID. And um, obviously when COVID started hitting, then we had to make a pivot like, you know, the rest of the world did and go online. So that's been um, our, our, you know, personal, um, our church planning journey. It's just getting together with a group of people, um, being present in our neighborhoods, uh, being present in our places of play, work and rest at the gym, I, you know, whatever at the bar, coffee shop. I did Bible study in the, the lobby of a gym with a bunch of non-Christians for a while. Um, and then just invite them into uh, the relationship with us and our families and then the church. So, um, like I said before, our vision is to plant a church um, and it's to be a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church planting church. And our, our hope and our goal, God willing, is that we would plant other churches from this church and, and really grow, not just for seating capacity, but for sending capacity is my heart. Uh, personally, um, uh, I've been married uh, for 13 years this week. And uh, you can see this next picture, uh, picture of my son. Uh, we were trying to um, have a baby for seven years and, and we've had a number of miscarriages. In a, in a failed foster adoption that we fostered a little boy from the hood uh, for about a year. And then God's blessed us uh, with a child. So um, last thing about me, you'll see my family here in this next slide is uh, my, my family here just in this living room um, where I'm doing this uh, word for you today. So you can go ahead and take off the slides and um, actually go to the uh, scripture, uh, Philippians 1, and you can just kind of camp here. Uh, what I want to encourage you this morning is to, I want to encourage you with this text, uh, similar to what I'm bringing my church, um, my church planting team through is Philippians. And I want to encourage you this morning to take a look at this text and ask God, God, what would you want to speak to me today? Not, not what would Lita want to say, but what God, what do you want to say to me? I know oftentimes we have a guest speaker or a pastor and we, we wonder, oh, what do, you know, do I want to hear this guy? Do I want to listen to this guy? Uh, what is he saying? Uh, I want you to ask God 
God, what are you asking me to know, do, or feel and experience this morning as we read this? So I'll go ahead and read for you Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, I'm going to read that part again, because I, I know if you're anything like me, you kind of gloss over the first reading. So I'm going to read the first 12 and start from the top. And this time, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me a couple of words. I want you to know, this is what Paul's saying to the church in Philippi, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Everybody say, advance the gospel. Wherever you are, you could say if you're in your dining room, your bedroom, kitchen table, hopefully not the bathroom, but go ahead and say that, advance the gospel. Verse 13, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and, and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would now speak to us through uh, the, this, the broken word of man, through my broken and sinful flesh, Lord, that you've redeemed, that you've claimed your own that you have imputed your righteousness upon. And now I stand before you um, wounded yet healed by your blood. And with my imperfect words, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be delivering to each person in the sound of my voice, your heart. And as we lean near to the words of your heart, that we would hear that it is beating for the lost. It is beating for our neighbors, that the word of your heart is beating for those that are far from you. So Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak life into us, that you would right now through your word, that you would comfort those afflicted and afflict the comforted for your glory and for the advance of your gospel in Jesus name. Amen. You can go ahead and take that uh, slide off for now. Uh, I'm going to just spend a little bit of time on verse 12 and 13 here. Um, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, everybody where you are, say to me, has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Let me ask you a question, family. How are you doing during the quarantine period that we're in and during this pandemic? Um, I'm personally grateful that I'm not sick right now and that I'm able to pay my mortgage, uh, but I struggle. I struggle pretty hard. I struggle with anxiety and I battle stress. I have alopecia on my head. Um, I grieve not having the support of family and friends with a newborn and with a startup church. Um, I miss running up and down the basketball court talking smack at people. And I miss, as Pastor Helicon said, drinking a dark roast, uh, Jacob's Wonder Bar at Phil's. Well, let me ask you a question. How do you feel? Uh, are you thinking, man, I can barely make it another day with little ones in the house. Thank God they've opened up schools again or at least child care. Or are you thinking, I can't make another week like this at work or with no income and I don't know how I'm going to make rent. Or maybe you're not in despair. Maybe you're just, okay, um, more downtime for me, my family, more DoorDash hobbies, more cooking, more sourdough bread to bake, go through more stuff that I want to do. I want to offer you today, family, um, a different perspective. As Paul was quarantined, Actually, he was imprisoned. Um, 
he could have easily thrown in the towel, thrown a pity party or try to distract himself with Netflix prison. I don't know if they have that. Probably not. And food recipes to cook. They probably didn't have that too. But this is what Paul writes in verse 12 and 13. He says in this letter to the church in Philippi, as he's writing from prison, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. What Paul is saying is what happened to me is God's work through me. What has happened to me in this imprisonment and being shackled up because I was preaching the gospel is God's work through me to advance the gospel. And I want to invite you to see one of the darkest seasons that we've lived through in this pandemic of, and quarantine as not just something that's happening to you, but it's something that's happening through you to see that there is a greater redemptive purpose. Um, Jocelyn, if you could put up that next slide, this is a picture here of uh, just uh, the Holocaust that many of you uh, have studied and known before, but there's a psychiatrist named Viktor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl survived this uh, Holocaust um, as a psychiatrist. And he writes in many books and writes about how purposeful living gives people hope in the most dire circumstances. He said that some in the concentration camp were talking about suicide, just throwing in the towel. I'm done with this. And who would blame him for that? Viktor Frankl said, if you kill yourself, you will rob yourself of a redemptive purpose. They're like, dude, you are tripping. What redemptive purpose are you talking about? Victor said, if you live and they kill us, your death will serve a greater redemptive purpose because it will teach the world how evil they are. And spirits immediately rose. You can go and take off that picture, Jocelyn. Thank you. In a time where it's easy for you and I to see the four walls of despair caving in, like we are in this version of American Bay Area prison ourselves, it's so easy to fall into self-despair, self-distraction, um, self-preservation mode. But we have to ask God, God, what is the greater redemptive purpose you are doing in this season of my life. I think number one, God is doing, a, doing something to you, but he's also doing it for you. It's, it's drawing each of us, I'm sure as your pastors have led you, to be in more intimate relationship with him right? God is working in you for you to develop your heart, your character, your soul, but he's also working through you. You know, pandemic and suffering doesn't just mean Jesus followers have the green light to go through all of Netflix, even though Tiger King was crazy. That was a trip, but pandemic and suffering is exactly the vehicle God uses to activate Jesus followers to join on a greater redemptive purpose to advance the gospel. Suffering is a part of God's plan to move the kingdom forward. If you look at Acts 1, you see Jesus. He says, go be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And they don't. They just stay within the four walls of the city for seven chapters until Acts 7. What happens? The stoning of Stephen, right? And after he got stoned and persecution broke out, then they were scattered. And it took something that horrified and shook them, but it moved them and rattled them outside of the four walls that they were comfortable in. What happened to Stephen was God's work through him. Then you look in Acts 28, Paul himself was the prisoner at that time, was, was being transported on a boat to Italy. A storm hit the boat, and all the people were shipwrecked on an island called Malta. And as they were on the beach, they met natives, and these natives brought the, them to the chief whose father was ill. 
and Paul prayed for his father and he got miraculously better. And then the island started bringing all their sick to Paul and he started doing ministry for them. God used that storm that was not a part of human planning to bring healing to the people of Malta. When Paul landed on the beach, he could have given a million reasons to just chill. Hey, y'all, I know you're hurting. I know you guys have pro- just ch- let me just breathe or just got into self-preservation mode and just fight off the natives. He could have done a million different things. I just got shipwrecked. Just give me a minute or hide and run, whatever. But he allowed something to happen to him and realized it was God's work through him. And here we see again in this text that what he says, what happened to me, verse 12 and 13, really served to cause, to advance the gospel. Because he understood what's happening to me is, is God's work through me. God is allowing quarantine in you, family, church family, not just for you. He's doing something in you, for you, and through you to the world. So I want to give us three practical ways that we can live this out as we see um, in text that Paul has this perspective. And I want to invite you into connect the dots to see how maybe you can also see this time as God's something doing through you and give you three different ways that you can serve your family, your neighbors, uh, people far from God to advance the gospel, just like Paul did. Now I'll give you a little acronym here, PIG. Prayer walk, invite, and give. Prayer walk, invite, and give. So if you look at uh, first one, P, prayer walk, um, verse 13, Paul was in prison. Scholars write that there would have been a, a soldier chained to him day and night. They might have done a swapping of the guard sometimes, um, maybe six hour shifts, maybe longer. Uh, But then he says this in verse 13. I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me, verse 13, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. The first time he had with the guards was the very part of God's plan to advance the gospel for the guards' salvations. And I wonder, family, I wonder who you are in and around day in and day out. Who are you chained next to in this time of quarantine? I got to say, it's your neighbors. Like you, they've canceled their travel plans, their weddings, their events, And I believe these are the very people God is inviting you to reach. So uh, what um, I'd invite you to do is to write a list of people as you go around um, of the people you meet, of your neighbors on a piece of paper, write down their names and just pray for them. The first P is prayer walk, right? Um, You know you need the walking, okay? If you're anything like me, COVID-19, I put 19 pounds in COVID-19. So I need prayer walking. What I do is I take prayer walks on a regular basis. I'm just praying for people. I'm praying for the houses I walk on, praying for the street I walk on, praying for the block I live on. Before COVID-19 hit, I knew about a dozen families. So I can walk you down my street right here and just name this one is Ted and Amy. That one is Rushid and Sneha. You know, this one over here is Joe and Jackson. I can just name the families. I can name their children. I can name for you what, uh, what school, what work they do, what stories they got. Um, because on my prayer walks, I'm open to interruptions. I'm open to being stopped. I'm open to uh, seeing interruptions as God's invitation to something that he's doing. So, um, in this time of quarantine, the 12 families, and by the way, they didn't come right away. We've lived here for eight years now, and it's developed over the years. Uh, but because of quarantine, it has jumped up to 25. So I have a map, and I drew, I drew out a map of the, my block. And on the map, I have all these houses, and I have 25 houses with a family name, uh, all the kids' names, and just praying for them on a regular basis. I go about my walk. And I see interruptions as invitations. I'm not just trying to get to my destination, which is 
weirdly enough, back home. It's like when you're on a walk, you're like, don't bother me. Where are you going? Back home. You just left from there, right? You're taking a big circle. So you see interruptions as God's invitation to you. Um, just a couple stories that happened to me is um, I was, you know, going out and about meeting people uh, when COVID-19 first hit, I was putting flyers under people's doormats. And these flyers just said, Hey, if you have essential needs, if you have a grocery run that you need help with or anything, just let me know if you need encouragement or prayer, let me know. So I put my name, my contact, and I put these flyers under people's doormats and I was going door house to house, just slipping on people's doormats and one door opened. Now, I was just kind of taken aback, and it was uh, a mom uh, with her kid, and the mom shared, like, after she's like, what are you doing? I was like, well, hey, I'm just, uh, I just live down the street. I'm your neighbor. I've never met her before, by the way. She lives maybe eight houses down this way. And I just told her, I'm just putting out these flyers. I want you to know I, I want to be here in case you have a need. I know some people are uh, immunosystem compromised, and uh, I just want to be here to uh, give a help, a helping hand if people need it. And she's like, Oh, that's so nice of you. And then she started talking about how she's doing and during the quarantine. And, and one thing led to another, she started talking about how she just lost her father. He passed away. And I just started listening from like social distance. Obviously I'm far away. I'm not even like six feet. I'm like on the curb and she's like at her door and she's just sharing her guts and just listening and listening and listening at the end. I'm like, can I pray for you? And she's like, yeah, sure. And I pray for her. And I'm like, just, you know, at a distance praying and, and, and I leave and she, and she says, man, that was so nice. Thank you. I walk back home. My other neighbor who I do know whom we've had over for dinners. Um, he's not a Christian. He's not church. He he's driving by. He stops his car in front of me. And he says, Hey Lita, I'm on the way to the hospital because my dad's about to uh, pass. Can you pray for me? He's never asked for anything spiritual. I've tried to invite him to church, engage him many times. He's always kind of struck me off, ignored me. And he's like, Hey, can you pray for me? I'm like right there on the street. I prayed for him. He was in his car again, socially distanced. I, I want to share with you these, these stories is these are the things that are happening to me on a, almost a semi-regular basis where when I'm prayer walking, I'm asking God, God, give me a burden for the people around me. Give me opportunities. You know, give me boldness as I walk this and see interruptions as invitations. And God's opened up doors, literally, so that I can pray with people. And if you just step outside of your house right now, family, you will inevitably find somebody who doesn't know God, doesn't go to church. Maybe he's over church or de church because 95% about of the Bay Area is de churched and unchurched. We live in the most unchurched part of the country here in the Bay. So you just throw a rock outside your window, you're going to hit, you know, uh, six, seven people uh, that don't go to church, that are spiritual but not religious, are over churched or de churched. And I believe this is an invitation, a season to invite you to live incarnationally right where you're at, to see what God has done and allowed to you, to, to see it as God's work through you to advance the gospel, starting right where the people you are, quote unquote, stuck with. Like Paul, shackled in prison, the imperial guards found Jesus. You might be thinking, oh, I don't have the gift of evangelism. You may not have the gift of evangelism, but you do have the responsibility for it if you follow Christ. So as you walk, I invite you to pray over the people that you walk by. And that as you pray, be open for interruption, be open for uh, seeing those interruptions as God's invitation to do something bigger. Um, the second part is I. So first one is prayer walk. Second uh, is I, it's invite. Um, for Easter, I had um, my team hand out the same flyer. So I started handing out flyers to my neighbors, just putting them in under doormats. So I'm not touching anything and I'm keeping social distance from everybody. I had my team do the same thing. And here in this next slide, you'll see a picture of a, a couple in my team. And they were doing the same thing, um, handing out flyers. And they were uh, going door to door, just handing out flyers. Oh, by the way, this is my neighbors, um, uh, Rusha and Sneha. And they, uh, we were handing out and we saw them on the street. So we started talking with them. And we've had them over before for dinner before all this happened. Um, really good people. We love their family. They love ours. And they always ask us about our baby. And we check in with them and then talk with them about spiritual things too. Uh, if you go to the next picture, you'll see uh, this is a part of uh, our team members here for our church planning, uh, church planning team that uh, I sent them out and did the same thing. 
thing. Say, hey, you go now do the same thing. So they start handing stuff out, uh, slipping little pieces of paper saying, hey, we want to be here for you, uh, encourage you and to support whatever you need, you know, grocery runs, whatever you need, let me uh, let us know. And uh, this family here actually had um, uh, neighbors call them back and they said, hey, like, thanks for dropping that off. Now, th these neighbors of theirs don't, didn't go to church. They didn't know Jesus, uh, but they, they invited them over for a social distance outdoor picnic in their front yard. And since then, they have been, uh, their neighbors actually have been initiating with them and, and uh, uh, initiating to hang out, initiating to uh, see each other. And it's funny because my team member here said, man, they're teaching me, a Christian, how to neighbor, how to be a neighbor. These un non church people, unchurched people are teaching me how to neighbor. So, family, it's not just, realize it's not just you working, it's the Holy Spirit that's already working in the people around you. He's already doing things in the family's lives around you. It's just a matter of you responding and obeying to Him. Uh, during quarantine, I've personally had three of my neighbors. Uh, watch our sermons and watch our online worship gatherings that I've been inviting for years that just said, no, frankly, I'm not interested, but they started watching. And so three different families and households have been tuning in. Um, and because we invite it, we have to make the invite, right? Partner with the God, what God's already doing in their hearts. Um, recently on a prayer walk, I was walking and across the street, I saw uh, a couple guys hanging out with their car. So I walked up to them and just started conversing. Hey, what's up? I live over here. Um, my name's Lita. What's your guys' name? We started talking and they, they we started talking about cars. You know, I don't know much about cars. I drive a Kia. It's a, uh, you know, V4 turbocharged. That's all I can tell you. Front wheel drive. That's all I got for you. But they start talking about, I start asking about their cars. Tell me about your cars, what you're doing to it. And what's, what's it about? And they start telling me, and then I invited them to church. And then they said, okay. And they followed us on Instagram, followed us on YouTube. And now they are part of our uh, uh, people we engage. These are people that I live next to. So, uh, but it took me walking across the street, seeing interruptions as invitations for God's greater redemptive purpose and um, being able to um, invite, invite my neighbors. So um, church planting is not just about me. Uh, church planting is about equipping my team. So uh, this couple that um, they basically uh, I told you earlier, they had the social distance picnic outside on the front lawn. It's not just about me. It's about the people I'm equipping and the people that I'm leading and serving to do the same. And, and that's what I encourage you with. It's not just watching Helicon or Pastor Joey, um, watching your pastors do the work of ministry. Their job is to equip you to do the work of ministry so that you are out there. You are seeing God for your very self and him move uh, in people around you. Um, I was teaching this on this a year ago, uh, this concept of in, engaging your neighbors, now teaching in a different way because of it wasn't COVID-19 and it involved food. And so I was teaching about, you know, first, you know, invite them over for a meal. And then about six months after I preached that, one of the members uh, found me and they're like, hey, I actually did what you said. And it was incredible. Hudson just gave me an amen. If you're wondering, that was my little boy. Uh, he's my amen corner over there. So he came back to me and he said, I actually did what you said. And they responded. My neighbors responded. We ate together, invited them to church, and they actually started, they actually engaged with me. So it's not just about listening, family. It's about doing. Uh, maybe you've been listening to sermons for a long time. Maybe you're busy. But my question today is, are you busy doing what God wants you to do? Uh, Matthew 28, 19, therefore go make disciples of all nations, Acts 1, 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Maybe it's actually time to live this out in the very place you live. How do you grow? You know, in our Western modern world, we think, oh, it's education right? So I better go to class, Sunday school. I better go to get my MDiv or my college degree, or I better take classes about God, or I better read a book about God, or sit in a circle in a small group and learn about God. But that's really not the full picture of spiritual growth. Spiritual growth has to include 
missional living because missional living actually forces you to mature. It actually forces you to grow because only until you live on mission and you actually start taking risks, reaching out to your neighbors and coworkers and families that, and friends that don't believe in Jesus, that you will have to depend on God. You know, I went to, I went to a fuller for my MDiv and I just learned a bunch of stuff here. I just learned a bunch of knowledge. But it wasn't until I started church planting, when I started had to get out in the field, OJT, on-job training, that I actually had to depend on God, pray like I've never prayed before, hear from God like I never heard before, learn about God's character and his faithfulness and provision in my life, only through doing it. And family, our American church, the, the problem is spiritual insight can often be an allusion to spiritual growth. You think you're growing because you're gaining insight and knowledge, but that's not growth. That's just adding information. And we know knowledge can puff up, but love will build up. So the first two P and I is prayer walk. Uh, then the second I is to invite. And to finish out our PIG acronym is to give. Give your money, give your stuff, give your body away. Do grocery runs for the elderly, volunteer in your city's food bank, join local networks to distribute essentials to the homeless. Give yourself away. Um, what are the needs of your neighbors? This next slide here, my wife and I, we regularly will drop off uh, gifts to uh, our neighbors and we'll drop off fun packs because they got kids and they got stuff they need. So we'll put in uh, toys, coloring books. Uh, we'll put in stuff there and just drop it on the front porch and say, Hey, thinking of you praying for you. And we love you. And they love it. We text each other. They show us, they send us texts back. Hey, thank you so much for the gifts. Um, I dropped off a, a kid's basketball hoop before at my neighbors, uh, all new in box. You know, there's, there's needs your neighbors are going to have right now with their kids. And this is a great time for us to, to meet those needs and to help them and to give our stuff away to them. So um, give yourself away. Give your money away. Our church has fundraised $2,200 uh, and, and with our family and friends to, to give to a, a local uh, health center that helps low income and uh, undocumented people. Uh, our church has given away $13,000 to a camp that was hit heavy by COVID-19 and had to do a lot of layoffs and has a lot of hourly workers that they had to care for in this tough time. Give yourself away. Give your money away. Give your stuff away. Uh, I FaceTimed my mom the other day. She goes to River of Life, if you guys know that church in San Jose. And she was in a warehouse. You know, she's retirement age. And she was uh, at a food bank and, and um, was volunteering. And I was FaceTiming her with Hudson, our, my son. And then I was like, yeah, cool, cool. And then I hung up the phone. And I was like, wait, you are in a warehouse. Wait, you're you're one of the high risk people. Why are you there? Isn't that risky? John Patton, a missionary, um, he's a missionary to a small island of natives off the coast of Australia. And while he was preparing to go to the island, an elder named Mr. Dixon wrote against him, warning of the dangers, the cannibals, you'll be eaten by cannibals. But to this Patton responded, the missionary said, you are advanced in years now and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave eaten by worms i confess to you that if i live or die serving and honoring the lord jesus it will make no difference to me whether i'm eaten by cannibals or whether i'm eaten by worms and in the great day my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen redeemer over 15 years the entire island became christian where John Patton famously penned, and I paraphrase, I am immortal until Christ's work for me is done. Do you believe God is sovereign and nothing that happens to you that God didn't plan, it will be for your good? Joseph was in front of Pharaoh. Joseph, he himself was enslaved, in prison, gone through the most horrific suffering. And he stood in front of the very family members that threw him into slavery after many years. And he was in a place of power. 
And he told them, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He didn't say God corrected for good. He didn't say God turned for good. God repurposed for good. He said, no, God meant it for good. God was in it from the beginning. So what kind of freedom does that give you to live out uh, the gospel, to advance it in your own life, to know that God is in this quarantine with you? God is in this pandemic with you, that God is working and active, not just doing something to you or allowing it to you and for you, but through you. In this window of time of history, when you give small acts of kindness will go a long way. Um, I had some neighbors that they uh, some had a, a, a fire truck go to their house. And I went over and I brought over a bottle of wine. And I brought over a note. I said, hey, I'm praying for you. Please let me know if you need anything. I saw a fire truck outside of your house. Hope everything's okay. He came outside and he took the stuff and he looked at it and he said to me, hey, I won't forget this. Thank you, man. You know, when all this is over, family, people will remember how they were loved. People will remember how they were led. Your neighbors will remember the seeds you sow today. Um, just a quick word on our country's climate. Um, you know, you look at what happened with George Floyd, and this has to do with giving too. And you look what happened with all the civil unrest and all the protesting that's happening. Um, I look at that picture and I see one of the cops was Asian. And that really struck me because I think, you know, what if he did something? What if he tackled the cop and he pulled him off? Or what if he, what if he did something to save George's life? You know, a lot of us also face, uh, you know, the same thing is that maybe we don't have the opportunity to save somebody's life, but we will have whatever opportunity God gives us, you know, whatever it means, whether it's to respond, whether it's to educate, whether it's to lament and learn, whether it's to enter into the pain of our black brothers and sisters that are suffering right now and hurting and learn about systemic oppression and to learn about how to use our voice in God honoring ways while loving the police force while uh, advocating for uh, the reform this country needs. So give means you give to the needs of your neighbors, the needs of your city, the needs of our country. Uh, pig. So be a pig for Jesus. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4.10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Be a pig for Jesus. Prayer walk, invite, and give. Give me a second as I get a cup of water. Today's water break is brought to you by my son Hudson. Give me a second. So I'll close with this story. <clears throat> if you look at 2 Kings 7, the Syrian army at this time has surrounded the Israelites and they were cutting off supply lines to the city. The Hebrews got so desperate, they were eating donkey heads and they were eating their own children. There were four lepers living outside the city gates and they told themselves, if we go to the city, we're going to die because we've got no food in there. If we stay here, we're going to die because we got no food here. We might as well give ourselves up to the Syrian army. Maybe they'll have mercy on us. So they went over there and they gave themselves that are ready to be whatever prisoners to the Syrian army. And this is what 2 Kings 7 says. And when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent and ate and drank, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid from them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. You have to understand that before what happened is God caused a big sound to scare off the Syrian army so that when they heard it, they threw all their stuff off. They ran off without any of their supplies and gear, and they just took off because they thought they were surrounded by armies that uh, were surrounding them to, to finish them off. So it says here that the lepers actually found an empty, abandoned camp, and they ate and drank. They carried off silver and gold and clothing and hid them and hoarded them, and they kept coming back to hoard more stuff. 
In verse 9, they, then they said to one another, one guy, one leper was like, click, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. Ooh, good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light punishment will overtake us, now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. And they told the city and everybody went and ate the food they needed to eat. It saved the entire city. Family, they found food that would save a city that was perishing and dying of hunger. But we have found something better than the cure for COVID-19. We have found not food or the cure, but we found the antidote to sin and death and hell and the wrath of God itself, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have found the good news that says you are more diseased, you are more wounded, you are more broken and hurting and fallen than you will ever understand and know. You have offended God who is deserving of the, the most intense and hideous wrath brought upon yourself but you are more saved, you are more loved, you are more cherished and precious before God than you will ever know because of the good news of Jesus Christ that came to earth, the Son of God, and took on your sins. And he died a painful, excruciating death and was risen in three days to prove all he said was true, to overcome the uh, death and sin and the grave. And he gives you and imputes upon you his righteousness. This is the good news that you and I have been given. Those four lepers have found food that saved the city. You and I have found the gospel that is going to save the world. And family, my question for us is, do we see that what is happening to us is God's work through us? That now what God is allowing to you, it's not just allowing to you, but it's, he's doing a work for you and through you to your very neighbors, to your coworkers, to your family and friends that don't know Jesus. How is he inviting you to a greater redemptive purpose? And like Paul, can we see that this quarantine imprisonment, Paul's shackled hands. Can we see, like Paul, that what happened to us has really served to advance the gospel to the very people we live next to day in and day out. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that the words of your scripture would go forth to every household and every individual and that you would bring us new life, that you'd awaken the slumbering, that you would raise the dead, and you would start with us to show us the gospel truth that you've given us, the formula to life. Not that we have to follow some equation to live or some plan or journey, but that we've been given new life, that you've already have given us new life through the gospel new identity in Christ. And because you saved us from the pit of despair and from hell and our own sin, we are now, now called to do the same for others, starting with the very blocks we live on. So Lord, give us this new truth, invigorate our souls, give us your love and tell us how much you love us so we would carry this message on so that we would see this is not just something happening to us, but it's happening through us to advance the gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, uh, thank you, Pastor Lita, uh, for um, sharing God's word with us. Um, yeah, I really look forward to um, you sharing also in Sunday School later. Um, Jocelyn, if we could have the slide. Um, as we just prepare to sing um, a song in response, uh, would you all please rise? Um, and let's sing together.
What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep endless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my Savior will defend me. Let us continue to praise God uh, through the singing of the doxology.
Please remain standing as we close in prayer and then with the benediction of the Lord's blessing. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for this time, Lord, where we can be reminded, God, of who you are, God of the gospel, or what you've done on the cross for us, Lord. Lord, thank you for reminding us, God, through your word, Lord, that this gospel that many of us have received, God, is also meant to be shared with those around us. And so, Father, we ask, Lord, uh, that as we uh, conclude our time together here this morning, Lord, that your spirit and your word would compel us, Lord, to go, Lord, knowing that you are not just working in us, God, but through us, Lord, ultimately for your glory, God, in advancing of your kingdom and the spread of the gospel. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen and amen. Again, we're so glad you could join us uh, this morning for our worship service. And uh, as Hannah mentioned earlier at 1130, uh, Pastor Lita will also be sharing uh, with us during our Sunday school hour. And so you could see, I think, the link in the uh, chat box below uh, for the Zoom link for our Sunday school uh, hour together as well. We invite you to, yeah, come join us. Uh, feel free to take a break and join us in about 15 minutes or so. Again, so glad you're here with us this morning. Pastor Halcon, is there anything else we want to mention to our church family this morning? Um, yeah, no, just um, we'd love to have um, our sixth and sixth grade and above um, students from middle school and up to come and join us for um, just a continued Sunday school with uh, a brother, Pastor Lita, to share more. And, and also kind of tied into it is we are surveying right now for ways to love our neighbors. And that's why we're surveying right now is this push for us to go and reach our neighbors that we have been kind of in a sense chained to, as my brother Lita pointed out. And so that's why we're, we're starting this initiative. You are on mission already in your community. We can't go elsewhere, but our mission field is right next door. And that's why I think this was such a timely and challenge and encouragement and praise God for that. And thank you for my brother, Pastor Lita, sharing so beautifully about being pigs because, you know, I'm kind of piggy. <laughs> so <laughs> it makes sense to me. It appeals to me. Anyways, um, yeah. So I'd love to see you guys at 1130 um, on our Sunday School link. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. And please feel free to unmute yourself to say hi to everybody as well. All right, thanks, Lita. Thank you. I'll see you. I look forward to being with you all uh, at the Sunday School Hour. It's going to be very interactive, so I welcome you guys to bring um, all your questions and, and comments, and I'd uh, love to hear you, your thoughts, how you're processing all this. Thank you all. See you soon. Yeah. Thanks, brother. Happy Father's Day, guys. Happy Father's Day, everybody. forgot to even say that. Yeah, I guess we should say that. Huh? Happy Father's Day. I guess Al has to hear that too now. First Father's Day for him. Some of you are used to it, right? Well, some of us will be one day, hopefully, fathers. So praise God. I love you guys. Thank you for being here with us, okay? See you later.